All right, so let's uh, quickly get a gauge, of course, what it all means for the local session due to kick off in just under 57 minutes' time. Futures flat, as we saw before, just down the one point. But hopefully, I think um, the ADRs for both BHP and Rio are suggesting a good move for higher. I think we saw uh, in that London session on Friday, they're both up around about 1%. So yes. hopefully some follow-through to our own session for the miners. Yep, excellent. All right, well, change of pace now and here to talk global investment strategy is Nathan Bell from Peters McGregor, who joins us live at the desk. And um, Nathan, an incredible run that we continue to watch for these tech stocks again there on, on Friday. Um, and Amazon in particular, as we were just saying before, Jeff, Jeff Bezos now, $100 billion. Have you been kind of participating in, in the, uh, the good run up for those tech companies? Uh, so we own the Chinese tech stocks, so I'm glad we've got those because we don't have any of the US ones. <laughs> yep. uh, we've earned in not owning them. Uh, they continue to power on and their competitive advantages are just huge. You know, I just keep telling people this isn't 1999 where valuations were done on eyeballs mm. um, and on business strategies that hadn't been proven. These are absolute monopolistic businesses and I actually think the biggest risk to them now is potentially regulation because they're just so profitable. Mm. So when looking at uh, some of the, the uh, Asian ones, in particular Tencent, which you, have, which you do have a large holding in, not hype, I mean, justified in terms of, I mean, how much is it up this year? It's, it's extraordinary. <laughs> yeah, so it's basically doubled over the last 12 months or even a bit more. And yeah, as I, again, I say to people, this is, was a $250 billion business 12 months ago. Now it's over $500 billion. Like, these aren't tiny numbers. <laughs> uh, and the economics of these businesses seem to get bigger, uh, better the bigger they get which is extraordinary. You'd expect these big giant companies to slow down at some mm. point. And 10 cents last quarter, it grew the bottom line at 69%. What in particular? What's driving that growth for them? Yeah, for 10 cents, it's online gaming. So a lot of people compare it to is like the Facebook of, of Asia or all these others. And um, that is true to a, a degree, but the advertising is only just starting at 10 cents. What's driving the numbers is pure online gaming. Uh, the numbers are off the charts and it shows how addictive these things are. And, uh, in a sense, it's a bit like pokies without regulation and people sort of pay as they go. It's not like the old days where you bought a cartridge and that was all you paid yeah. for. You pay as you go and it's so addictive and uh, the Chinese government's actually put controls on how much time young people can spend on there <laughs> and yet we're still getting these sort of numbers. Mm. So with a Tencent, for example, that's had an incredible run up, I mean, do you think it can continue or is there a point when you say, OK, it's, it's, you know, we, we have to start taking some profits off the table here? Yeah, so we actually started on Friday of right. taking those profits and we think fair value is probably about 10% higher. Mm -hmm. But again, Again, when you've got these companies trading on these big multiples, uh, you're really be betting that a lot of these good things are going to happen. So the yeah. advertising is going to take off. Yes. Um, you know, and that is pay it's got a PayPal sort of business, and that's going to take off. So now you, we, you get into a valuation where all that stuff's basically priced in. So essentially, there's not a lot of margin of safety left. So uh, you know, another 10, 20 percent, and we'll probably be out. Where is the where is the projected growth? Um, figure to come from? Is it all domestic in terms of China or are you starting to see valuation creep in for potential offshore growth? No, I think it's definitely the former. I think the two big areas are the advertising. Uh, in their Facebook equivalent, you're only getting about one ad per person per day. In the West, you get anywhere from about 30 to 40 yeah. ads per day on Facebook, so it shows you uh, the opportunity there. Uh, but they also have TenPay, which is like the PayPal of China. Mm. Um, there's only two big companies like that. The other one's Alipay, run by Alibaba. And the government wants a very strong TenPay as some sort of competitor to Alipay. Uh, interestingly enough, Alipay actually has the biggest money market fund in China. Like, it's just staggering what these businesses are creating. Um, so we're actually glad that the government sort of come in and push Tencent uh, in that direction. So are, they, yeah. are they little... I mean, maybe not even little, but their own versions of Amazon that we're sort of starting to see creep out in terms of this behemoth that, that sort of cross-pollinate industries? Yeah, the interesting thing at the moment is, so JD is one we own. That's mm. probably people probably call more the Amazon of China because Alibaba is more like the eBay of China. And they're actually starting to make big moves uh, offline now. So they're actually starting to create stores and link that up with their online site. So this is a, a big development in the sense that this is actually quite a different business where it requires a lot of money to invest. Um, it hasn't really been proven that mm. bricks and mortar is going to work for these companies. But in China, you just don't have all that old retail mm. network that we take for granted in the West. So it is a big opportunity for those companies. What about for those investors perhaps that have missed out on the opportunity of, of say, a Tencent? Where else could they look at the moment to, to gain some of that um, potential upside? Yeah, so there's actually a sneaky way potentially to buy Tencent on the cheap. There's a company called Naspers. It's uh, in, listed in South Africa. Mm -hmm. It's South Africa's biggest company by an absolute mile. Uh, and what it did was actually bought a third of Tencent uh, about, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago for $37 uh, US million. 
and today that's worth about $180 billion. Gosh. So they've done nothing. They've just bought a stake <laughs> in a share and now they're the biggest company by a country mile and in South Africa. Uh, people believe that this is the single best uh, stock, listed stock investment that's ever been made. Who, who made this call? Yeah, they should just be, you know, they should be knighted, de deity almost. It's funny you say that because the company's actually under pressure and uh, interestingly the company actually trades at around a 35% discount just to its 10 cent holding and regardless of its other internet businesses. Uh, and a couple of the reasons are, one, they, people think they're going to have to pay a lot of tax at some point, which we actually don't believe is going to be the case. Right. Uh, but also people are just a bit fed up and think this gap is just going to sit there forever. Mm. Uh, we don't think that's the case, but uh, if you want to buy a 10 cent at basically a, about a 40% discount, that's the way to do it. Very interesting. All right, let's head across to um, the Europe and the UK. And I know that we have actually spoken to you time and time again about um, owning banks over there, particularly at a time when our own Aussie banks are under a lot of pressure, regulatory concerns and so forth. Are you still looking at some of those European banks as, as an opportunity? Yep, so uh, we haven't sold any of our European bank shares over the last couple of years since we started putting them together. And I think you're not really going to see huge share price increases until interest rates start going mm. up, or at least the expectation of interest rates going up. Mm. We saw the same thing in the US. We saw these actually quite clean businesses, and they just sat there. But as soon as people really believed that interest rates were going up, the money just flooded in. And we saw Bank of America, for example, go up about 130% mm. in 12 months. And again, this wasn't a small business. This was like a 70 or $80 billion business that doubled. So it's not like it was a secret. So I expect it will be the same for the European banks. You can still buy them at big discounts to book value, 3 to 4% dividend yields, safe balance sheets. It's the safest time to buy them in 15 years. It's the riskiest time to buy Australian banks in three decades. Hmm. What are you looking for, Nathan, when you're sort of scouring the, the world for opportunities? Obviously, you know, picked a gem in terms of 10 cents. You've been speaking about that for quite some time. The European banks, they've also done very, very well. I mean, what, what metrics are you generally, you know, judging businesses on when it comes to investing? Yeah, I think one of the most important ones, um, particularly for people at home that probably don't pay a lot of attention to this, I think it's the free cash flow of the mm -hmm. business. A lot of people look at the reported earnings, and I think more than ever today, I mean, I think uh, there's actually people that measure this. They measure the gap earnings versus the non-gap earnings in the US. And um, I believe the actual gap between, at the moment is the largest it's ever been. Now, that should actually probably scare you mm. um, because of people trying to, you know, in a sense, sell their earnings, which aren't real. Uh, but there are other occasions, so we own these broadband, internet broadband businesses, mm -hmm. and what they actually do is they have these huge depreciation expenses from laying the cable in the ground. But once they're actually in the ground, they last basically forever. Uh, but you've got this huge depreciation expense on the P&L, so your profit looks quite small, but the free cash flow that comes out the back after you've made the investment is huge. It can be quite hard to actually get a, an accurate gauge of the free cash flow. Uh, it's actually quite easy when you just go to the accounts. What you've got to work out is, uh, what sort of return you're going to get on that investment and I think that's where most people struggle because it's one thing to spend the money it's another thing to actually get a good return on, on those investments. Uh, for broadband for example uh, you've got cable TV well, businesses yeah. um, falling and people get quite frightened. Which in particular I want to ask you, you said you obviously looking at some of those broadband and cable businesses, which, which ones in particular? Yep. So the, the one that's the largest position in our portfolio is called Liberty Lilac. Uh, it's, uh, it's going to be basically spun off uh, hopefully this next month it's mm -hmm. the Latin American operations of John Malone's uh, broadband empire, internet broadband uh, empire. Um, it's trading like a regular telecommunications company, uh, which makes no sense to me. Telecommunications company has slow growth, <laughs> big dividend payers. Uh, Liberty Lilac is the opposite. It should be a fast growing internet business where internet usage rates in Latin America are half what they are in the West. So you've got this huge runway over the next 10 years for that to expand. Mm. Um, and when I think we get this spin-off, um, people, if you know the history of spin-offs, people don't, uh, they tend to undervalue them quite early and then they catch on later on that you've got a new management team, everyone's focused and it's amazing how the profit starts to increase uh, mm. when you've got that new management in charge. Mm -hmm. um, just, what, I mean, we're sort of looking ahead as we look out to 2018 and adjusting portfolios and assessing where we can find the, the best opportunities, I suppose. Where do you think right now, in terms of investment destinations, where do you think is you know, right foot for opportunity. Yeah, look, I, I still, like, we wrote a report in 2011, it was called the coming China bust. Um, <laughs> and we were very worried about, we were very worried about the debt. Um, but the thing, you know, we talk about these technology companies, uh, five years ago they weren't listed for a start. Um, second of all, they've got founders uh, with their own wealth on the line. Mm. Um, so these are very good operators uh, in very profitable industries. And I think China's, the quality of the companies coming out of there is improving every year. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed one trend is a lot of family-run companies are actually starting to hire professional management talent. And you're starting to see mar margins that, you know, way down here start to really expand and the profits come out. So even though I think China's got some real issues with the debt and they're going to have to get sorted out, uh, I actually think there's some really wonderful companies where if you can actually think 10 years ahead, 
um, you get to find opportunities that you just can't find you know, in the West. And India is another good example. Mm -hmm. Valuations are very high at the moment, so mm. it's no secret. But they're going to have more mobile phones in India in three years than what is in China. More <laughs> people on the internet. Uh, they've got the Adha national database system, which you uh, access with a thumbprint or a retina scan. Uh, that's the best technology in the world. Nobody else has this. That gives people ID for the first time. And there's a, a billion people in India just waiting to borrow money to buy homes, to yep. build businesses. Uh, like that's, that stuff's not going to, if there's a recession, mm. I mean, it's going to be temporary. You're not going to stop these tailwinds. So you're quite services orientated then when looking at these emerging economies for investment opportunities because Steve Johnson, who I know you know very well, used to work with, um, he's bearish on China largely for the, the reasons you gave, the idea of that the level of debt and that, you know, at some points, you know, Something's got to something's got to give. But if you look beyond those that are likely to be impacted towards services, is that what gives you that sort of confidence? Yeah, I mean we've got the Chinese renminbi hedged because uh, uh, I think there's a, yep. a real chance of a one-off devaluation. If the economy comes under real pressure, mm. one of the easiest valves to try and uh, stimulate the economy is to reduce yep. that hedge, a one-off devaluation. So we've definitely got that hedged, and I think that's a real uh, advantage we have as professionals that the mm. individual doesn't have, and that gives us confidence. Um, that we're not going to you know, walk in front of the steamroller there. <laughs> uh, and again, the technology stocks, the, the way I explain it to people is, you know, valuation aside, I expect them to behave in very much the same way that the technology companies behaved in the US during the GFC. They just emerged stronger and better than they ever were before. Uh, I think that's the same for those as well. So we're not buying apartment builders or cement companies in China or anything like that. Sure. And um, definitely the services side. All right. All right. Fantastic. Look, Nathan, always a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. All right, we are going to take a quick break here on Countdown. When we come back, we are going to talk fixed income with Mark Bailey. Stay with us.